Good evening and welcome. My name is Catherine McPherson and I am the chair of the Worship and Music Committee here at Islington United Church. It's my privilege to welcome you here tonight. We are in for a treat. Hymns have a power like nothing else. They offer us inspiration that's grounded in scripture. And whether a hymn was written 200 years ago or just yesterday, the wisdom of the scriptures meets us where we're at in the hymns. The Apostle Paul encouraged us to let the word of Christ dwell richly in us when we meet together. And we do this when we sing hymns, allowing the words and the melody to lift us, transport us, and sometimes even transform us. Our service tonight has been carefully created by Dr. Deborah Bradley, music associate at Islington United Church. Dr. Bradley is a lifelong church musician and has served as the director of music at several Toronto area churches. She holds a PhD in sociology and equity studies and is the author of many publications exploring how music education can enact and support anti-racist initiatives for learners of all ages. Although officially retired, Dr. Bradley remains very active in the music ministry, and for that, we are grateful because we're keeping her very busy. Deborah, thank you for your leadership this evening. Thank you also to soloists Dan Cantelier, Anya Suri, Jennifer Tavner, and to narrators Bronwyn Gates and Jack Grady. Before we begin, let us acknowledge the land on which we gather. We recognize that Indigenous peoples have been serving as keepers of this land for countless generations, long before European settlers came and began colonizing it. Indigenous communities continue their care for the land, and we are called to join them, informing our words and actions with the spirit of truth and reconciliation. We are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. We honor the Creator's light at work in their hearts, and we consider how the light of Christ calls us to follow in the way of Jesus, whose death on the cross calls us into right relationship with all peoples. I invite you to join me in prayer. Come to us, holy God, as we gather here with you. Bless us with your presence and surround us with your grace. As we sing together about the mystery of Easter, nourish us with the hope that the cross offers for ourselves, our loved ones, and our hurting world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able and to sing together Voices United 143, My Song is Love Unknown.
Well, good evening. I'm so glad to see all of you here and a welcome to those who are joining us online. I want to take a moment to tell you a little bit more about tonight's service. The hymn we just sang, my song is Love Unknown. Think about those last two words, love unknown, in this title. What does that actually convey? Is it possible for us as people in today's world to understand the kind of love that God showed us through Jesus, who suffered a brutal death on the cross on behalf of all humanity, and then rose again three days later? Tonight, we will spend some time together thinking through a love so profound that it overcame death, a love so amazing that we humans struggle to comprehend it, yet again and again, this love unknown wins. The concept of a love unknown is difficult to grasp. Throughout time, ever since Jesus' crucifixion, Humans have attempted to explore the profundity of the crucifixion through poetry, prose, and sermons, through artworks such as paintings, sculptures, tapestry, stained glass, and of course, through music. Tonight, we will look at the many ways that hymn writers have combined text and music to create a variety of expressions and unique ways to interpret the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, to express musically the deep, deep love of God. The unique combination of text and music provides us with an insight that words alone, images alone, or music alone cannot express. The combination of words and music can reach deep within us touching us emotionally and enabling us to find understanding that words may not adequately describe. So let's begin by singing the question that guides our thoughts tonight. Voices United 147, what wondrous love is this?
The hymn that we just sang emerged from the American South. It was first published in Richmond, Virginia in 1811 in a camp meeting songbook. The tune itself probably came from Great Britain, where it was known as the Ballad of Captain Kidd. However, the wondrous love text became associated with the tune and became popular at camp meetings throughout the South, particularly in Appalachia. They were published together in the shape note singing text, Southern Harmony. However, what wondrous love did not actually enter the hymnary until it was published in 1966 in the United Methodist Book of Hymns. Its haunting melody and open fifth harmonies express our human inability to adequately answer the question, what wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to lay aside his crown for my soul? In Romans 8, 38 and 39, the Apostle Paul reminds us that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above us or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Yet, if we as humans truly believed this, if we truly took it to heart, would we continue to do some of the horrible things that we do to each other? It is hard to fathom that God can continue to love us despite the atrocities humans have committed across history, and that continue to this day. It is indeed an ineffable mystery, a love unknown. In the African-American tradition, this belief in a God whose love survives all human hatred yielded a faith that carries continual hope for a better future. But creating a better future requires effort and an understanding of history to grasp what past events tell us about the present day. In this next song, born from the communal experience of enslaved Africans, the text calls each individual to reflect on Jesus' crucifixion in a way that is much more than simple mental recall of an event. It calls the community to bring these historic events to bear on the now and make them part of our story. The text requires us to give an account of ourselves. Do we stand by and merely watch injustice occur, assuming the role of not so innocent bystanders? Or do we live our lives in such a way as to prevent future injustices, to embody in our daily thoughts and actions a love that Jesus embodied throughout his life and, yes, even in his death? In giving this account of ourselves, might we begin to truly accept God's love unknown? Let us sing together now, Voices United 144. Were you there?
This next hymn illustrates how the question of love unknown has been pondered by Christians across the centuries. The melody was written about 1601 by Hans Leo Hassler. It was harmonized by J.S. Bach in 1729. The text we'll sing tonight was first written in 1656 by Paul Gerhardt. However, the English translation by James Waddell Alexander did not emerge until 1830. The first verse allows the singer to ask questions while maintaining emotional distance from the descriptions of Jesus' appearance and physical pain. But with each successive verse, much like Were You There?, the text takes on a more personal perspective. Verse 2 acknowledges Jesus' crucifixion as a sacrifice on the singer's behalf and offers a prayer for forgiveness. Verse 3 offers gratitude for Jesus' selfless sacrifice. The final verse is the most personal of all. The singer confronts their own death with the realization that the ability to accept God's unconditional love through Jesus' death on the cross will set me free. It is a verse of comfort, knowing that all who die believing die safely through thy love. It is a reminder in song of the beloved Bible verse, John chapter 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Please join us now in singing Voices United 145, O Sacred Head.
Much of the description in the hymn we just sang focuses on Jesus' body during the ordeal of crucifixion. Contemporary American hymn writer and multiple Grammy Award winner Twilla Paris brings the image of Christ's suffering into today's world, drawing on an adjective that seems contradictory to the image of Jesus' broken and battered body. As Paris puts it, the body of Christ is not only beautiful in his service to humanity, but beautiful even in gruesome death. Now that's a somewhat baffling image, a suffering, bleeding God as beautiful. Perhaps that was part of what Paris meant when she first introduced the song in 1990, saying she'd received a greater understanding of how to show God to others. A God that turns ugly into beauty. In today's context, the message calls on those who follow Jesus not to worry about appearances, the dirt under your fingernails, the scuff marks on your clothes, or the way you might smell after pitching in to serve. Perhaps the key here is acknowledging that beautiful isn't the operative word in this song, but how. Think about the how in living a life that honors Christ's sacrifice for us a life dedicated to sharing God's unconditional love unknown with all whom we encounter through whatever means works best for us or however we may identify ourselves around the theological banquet table. Let's listen now as Jennifer and and Anya share Twilla Paris's How Beautiful.
Just as Twilla Paris wrestles with the question of God's love unknown through service in How Beautiful, the beloved hymn writer Fanny Crosby also pondered the question of how beautiful in the words of her time. Her life was one of service, and she authored over 8,500 gospel songs. Though she lost her sight as an infant, Crosby began, began composing texts at age six. She later became a teacher at the New York School for the Blind, where she was a student. A friend of several presidents, Crosby became one of the most important advocates for the cause of those who are visually impaired in the United States. Her texts were set to the compositions of some of the most prominent gospel songwriters of the day, including William Bradley, Bradbury, William Doan, and Ira Sankey. In our next hymn, the beautiful is described through Crosby's vivid imagery and powerful metaphors. The cross, a fountain of healing streams, free grace, a daily walk with God, and faith, God's pursuing love and mercy. Jesus, the Lamb of God, beyond the river of death, heaven with its golden streets, and rest for the post-raptured souls. Fanny Crosby implores us to remain constant in our faith, to accept God's unconditional love, to revere the beautiful body of Christ, keeping these images always in mind. Let's sing together Voices United 142, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross.
Annie Crosby's text spoke of the beauty that God's love offers to us. Her imagery is uplifting in a personal way, just as so many of her hymn texts were personally inspired. Composers may be inspired to write hymn texts and tunes from any number of experiences and varied theological perspectives. Stuart Townend, contemporary British hymn writer, explains that he wrote the next hymn because there is a wonderful, omnipotent God who deserves our highest praise, and how we feel about it is in many ways irrelevant. I want to encourage the expression of joy, passion, and adoration, but I want those things to be the byproduct of focusing on God. I don't want them to become the subject matter. I'm trying to write songs that refer to us as little as possible, and to God, as much as possible. In 2005, Cross Rhythms magazine described Townend as one of the most significant songwriters in the whole international Christian music field. The Christian website crosswalk.com said, the uniqueness of Townend's writing lies partly in its lyrical content. There is both a theological depth and poetic expression that some say is rare in today's worship writing. The next song by Stuart Townend echoes 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. From the New Living Testament. Dan Cantiller will share Stuart Townend's beautifully poetic description of God's love how deep the Father's love for us. Following Dan's solo, let's sing together the beloved William Bradbury and Charlotte Elliot, Elliot, Elliot hymn, Just As I Am. The text of Just As I Am invites us to accept the unconditional love of God and Jesus for ourselves as individuals, assured that God is with us through our times of doubt and turmoil. It is a love that ensures that we can never be separated from God's love found in Romans 8, 38. Searing loss, the 
father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was a in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. His wounds have paid my ransom.
God loves with the agape, the love described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. God loves us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for us, that we might have everlasting life. This love is not based on performance. We are loved because we are part of God's creation. We can be assured of this because Christ loves us so much he was willing to go through death on the cross in order to deliver the promise of everlasting life. God's love is unconditional and undeserved. He loves us despite our disobedience, our weakness, our selfishness. He loves us enough to provide a way to abundant, eternal life. From the cross, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. If God loves those who sin that much, can we imagine how much he loves us? Let's join together in singing Voices United 658, O Love That Wilt Not Let Me Go.
We've already heard a little bit about hymn writer Stuart Townend. He also composed many hymns with Keith Getty, including the next hymn we will sing. Written in 2002, In Christ Alone was a collaborative effort between Townend and fellow songwriter, and now good friend, Keith Getty. The song came about in an unusual way, Townend explains. Keith and I met in the autumn of 2000 at a worship event, and we resolved to try to work together on some songs. A few weeks later, Keith sent some melody ideas, and the first one on the CD was a magnificent, haunting melody that I loved and immediately started writing down some lyrical ideas on what I felt should be a timeless theme commensurate with the melody. So the theme of the life, death, resurrection of Christ and the implications of that for us just began to tumble out and when we got together later to fine tune it, we felt we had encapsulated what we wanted to say. The song relays the story of the unconditional, mysterious love of God as expressed through Jesus' life on earth, his death on the cross and the promise of life eternal. In Christ alone, invites us to sing our own reaction to the good news of Jesus. That Jesus' unmatched power provides assurance that guilt need not plague us, death need not scare us, and hell can never take us. This is the promise of God's love unknown. Please stand now as you are able to sing in Christ alone, which you will find on the reverse side of your order of service.
1 John chapter 4, verses 14 to 19 reminds us, We have seen and testified that God has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. And so knowing that we are loved unconditionally by God and that God showed us this love by sending Jesus to walk among us, to serve those in need, to die that we might live, and to rise up after death to reassure us of this love, so amazing, so divine. Let us sing our closing hymn, Voices United, 149, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Let us now close in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, when we survey the wondrous cross, we are humbled by the depth of a love so profound that it has power over death and power to transform even after 2,000 years. Give us courage to claim the power of the cross, to witness to it and be transformed by it, fulfilling our calling as disciples of Christ. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, let us go forth into the world carrying this love that is so amazing and so divine that it demands our soul, our lives, our all. Go in peace.